Goodman's interest, and Sackowitz might wind up at dead end anyway. No, Goodman wouldn't, couldn't wait. It was difficult enough to wait until the six o'clock shift when old Carl came on. Goodman had always thought of him as old Carl, although Weissman couldn't have been over sixty-five, still it required retirement age for all Republic employees. Weissman looked far older, his brows crisscrossed with lines like a wartime map of Europe. His hair was a dirty yellow white, and his eyes were constantly bloodshot, the whites appearing pinkish as a result. He looked, Goodman thought, like an albino with a hangover. He'd wondered more than once if Carl had a drinking problem. Now, knowing the man had been in Adlercrawler, he wondered how Carl could possibly have avoided one. At 6.04 a soft knock sounded on the door of Goodman's office. "'Come in,' he said calmly. Carl Weissman entered, drab to the point of invisibility in his janitor's grays. "'Mr. Russell told me to come up here.' The voice was quiet, the accent Midwestern with only a hint of a middle European comic opera precision. What needs to be done? Weissman stood quietly like a soldier awaiting orders. I need your help, Carl, Goodman said. He didn't smile. He had the feeling that Carl Weissman had forgotten what smiles were for. We're whipping together a project on the Second World War. Yes, Weissman said. The rabbi told me of your visit to him. Goodman struggled to keep the angry surprise out of his face, but he felt his mouth twist nonetheless. The rabbi told you? He told me what you might want. And I'm sorry, Mr. Goodman, but I want nothing to do with it. Carl, be fair, Goodman said, damning the rabbi. You hardly know what this is all about. Oh, I know. I know exactly what it was about. Goodman shook his head. That's not what I mean, Carl, he stood up. Will you come with me? Just down the hall into Studio C. Let me explain the situation to you, that's all. You don't have to do anything you don't want to. This is just between you and me. If you don't want to help, fine. Mr. Russell doesn't have to know a thing. The very use of Russell's name was an unspoken threat. The janitors hated the building superintendent who ruled them like a petty tyrant. I don't care if Mr. Russell knows or not, Weissman said, his weak chin thrusting forward. But I... He hesitated, and Goodman dug into the silence. "'That's fine, fine,' he said, putting a hand on Weissman's shoulder. Five minutes. You don't have to say a word.' Goodman went out the door, not looking back to see if Weissman was following, knowing his confidence would pull the older man along. As he opened the door of Studio C's control room, the R.I. chords of Bartok's concerto for orchestra came lancing out, piercing the hall with sound. He turned, saw Weissman behind him, saw the wrinkled face pale to a pasty grayness while veins bulged blue beneath the paper-thin skin of the man's temples. Carl? Weissman feebly raised a hand, gesturing for Goodman to close the studio door. Goodman let the thick door drift shut and silence settled over the hall once more, broken only by Weissman's ragged, asthmatic breathing. What is it? Goodman asked though he was starting to suspect. Nothing, Weissman said. I feel faint, that's all. Goodman stared heavily at him, but the older man would not meet his eyes. Wait here a minute, Carl, he said, and stepped back into the control booth. When he reappeared, Sam Pearson, the sound engineer, was with him, and the room was now quiet, washed clean of music. Pearson glanced at Weissman, then walked away down the hall, while Goodman beckoned the janitor to join him inside. He did so obediently, and sat in one of the three high-backed padded chairs Goodman indicated. Carl, Goodman said, still standing. You were in Adler Kralla, weren't you? Yes. The whisper was clear and distinct in the perfect oral environment of the shadowy control room. On this machine, Carl, Goodman said, patting the gleaming surface of a TIAC four-track, is a tape I'd like you to listen to. No, I... I don't want to tell you what it is, Goodman went on, unheeding, because I think you'll know. Weissman looked up at the machine, from which the loaded reel and its take-up glared at him like sharp, pinpointed eyes, the four VU meters beneath shining like a row of yellow teeth. I must know, he said, what it is. I must know before you play it. Goodman sat next to him, his mood swinging from stern disciplinarian to suddenly relaxed friend, his personality adapting itself chameleon-like to what he felt would affect Weissman most favorably. 
Music, Carl, he smiled. Just some music. It would be unfair to Goodman not to say that something within him burned as he tried to persuade the janitor to do what he wanted, that no pain of betrayal gnawed at him even as he considered what his next method of coercion would be. But the sympathy he felt for the man before him was not so great as to smother the brighter urge, the demanding, overwhelming urge to fill a small cassette with memories of a hell where angels played, searing souvenirs so gripping that they would sell unit after unit forever and ever, and maybe even a spot on the billboard chart, and I'm goddamn made, and just a little music. No, no, Weissman said, refusal giving his voice added strength. No music. I don't want to listen to this music. Goodman pressed just a bit so as not to lose him. You don't like music, Carl? Everyone likes music. No, I don't listen to music. This is a record company, Carl. You've got to hear music around here. I, I don't. I wait until it's done. No music at night, huh? Goodman pushed now, hard and fast. Not at night. It's quiet. You scared of music, Carl? Not scared. I, I just don't... You looked scared just now. When the music came out of here, you looked scared as hell. What kind of music scares you, Carl? I'm not... I don't think rock scares you, does it? Or jazz? Maybe you don't like them, but there's one kind of music that really scares you, isn't there, Carl? No. There were tears in the voice. The jaw trembled like a long-held tower about to fall. Classical music, right, Carl? "'That's what scares you shitless, isn't it, huh? "'Don't talk to me like that.' "'The accent was becoming more pronounced, guttural and thick. "'Where did that happen, Carl, and when? "'I can guess. You want me to take a guess? "'Some place you were locked up, wasn't it? "'You have no right, and you're still there, aren't you, Carl? "'You've kept yourself locked up for over forty years. "'No!' Even in the perfect acoustics of the room, the voice echoed like a trumpet as the man leaped to his feet, his gaunt face towering above Goodman, who drew back involuntarily. "'Who are you?' he cried. "'Who are you to talk to me this way, to pry into my life? Hey, relax, just relax now.' He'd pushed too far. He realized he'd been clumsy, careless, misreading the man, and he could have kicked himself. "'I'm sorry, Carl. I, I just sort of got carried away, you know?' The older man went on as though he had never heard. You want to make your guesses, then guess. Yes, I hate music. I cannot listen to it. It makes me sick. Weissman's face twisted in trembling rage. Because of the camps. Because of Adler Crawler, yes. But you knew that, didn't you? Oh, yes, you're so smart. You knew that. Well, the way you acted when you heard the music, Goodman said, smiling, trying to look open and careless. "'And then I remembered a couple of times before—' "'Before. "'And I would go elsewhere when you were playing your music, "'when I would clean a toilet rather than hear this music. "'Carl, I'm sorry, really. "'All I want is—' "'What do you want me to listen to? "'Screams? "'People screaming? "'Isn't that what they call music now?' "'No, Carl. "'A string quartet.' Weissman seemed to freeze in place. Then the set anger of his face melted into a kind of wondering fear. A string quartet. The voice was far away, haunted, disembodied in the dimly lit room. Yes. Oh, my God, I've got him now. Will you just look at him? What is this quartet? It played there, Carl. Where you were. At Adler Crawler. The... The angels. That's what Commandant Hostler called them, wasn't it? The angels that played the heavenly music while the condemned went to their deaths. You have a recording of the angels? Goodman nodded slowly. A wire recording transferred to tape. It's on that machine right now. He gestured around the room at the hundreds of sliders and knobs and dials and meters. Everything is set to play it. All somebody has to do is push the play button on that machine. Weissman, Goodman observed gratefully, was once more watching the Tiak as he would a cobra, its hood spread, ready to strike. All it takes is a push, Carl. It's so easy. But I won't do it. I'd like you to hear it. I'd like you to tell me what you think of it, how it makes you feel. 
If you want to do it, Carl, all you have to do is press the play and record buttons on this smaller machine here, right next to the big one. Goodman felt vaguely absurd as he gave the instructions, as though he were advising a statue. But he had to make sure Weissman knew, knew and remembered. Just press both buttons at once and talk into the microphone. That's all there is to it. You understand me, Carl? He didn't answer right away, but finally a whispered, Yes, came out. Goodman leaned toward the unwillingly fascinated man and used all his wiles to sound like friend, brother, priest, father, confessor. All these years, Carl, you've kept yourself bound. Now, finally, you can be free. But it's got to be your choice, your decision. Goodman stood and went to the door. Nobody will come in here tonight. I'm leaving and everyone else is gone. If you want to walk out, fine. Just leave things as they are, and we won't talk about it again. But if you want to listen, it's here. It's waiting for you, Carl. It's been waiting for a long time. He opened the door and stepped into the hall, his last glimpse of Weissman an unmoving, huddled figure, whose head seemed buried halfway between his shoulders. Goodman felt jubilant. He would have his tape now, he had no doubt, if there was enough left in Carl Weissman after listening to the angels for him to articulate his thoughts and emotions. But after so many years of being bottled up, Goodman thought they should flow out of him like blood in a slaughterhouse. Goodman could have stood there all night waiting to hear the music from inside, waiting for Weissman to come out the door. But as much as he wanted to know whether or not Weissman would take the bait, he was hesitant about confronting the man again. Goodman generously interpreted it as decency on his part and decided to go home and try to sleep. It was hard to turn and walk down the hall, but it would have been harder to face Weissman after that music had blasted his soul. Morning would come soon enough, and he honestly hoped it would come for Weissman too, that hearing the music might somehow cleanse him of the terrors he'd borne for decades but only after he'd put those terrors on tape. 3. The eyes of the reels stared at Weissman. Time had stopped for him. 1988 was 1944 was 1988, and those years of horror and the empty years in between were all compressed into this hour, this moment in the dim room with the little lights like stars that expanded the time back into all the years again. He felt as though he would sit there forever, waiting for his finger to push the button and see what happened, see what he would do when the dark time came again. The past forty-four years he had been waiting, been pressing it away from him like some black, cold gelatin that seeped through his fingers and around his wrists, forcing him backward into a shadowy corner, where at last it would envelop him. And now the time was here, was all dark time, and the shadowy corner was this warm, softly glowing room where he sat and stared into the eyes and teeth of yesterday. An unexpected peace touched him then, and a sense of inevitability guided him forward, pushed the button so that the wheels began to turn. There was no sound at first, and Weissman leaned back, taking his gaze away from the rolling eyes, looking upward to where the twin speakers hung. Then a hissing filled the room, and he stiffened, knowing what it was. Not the hiss of a speaker or of old tape, but the sly, teasing hiss of wind, the wind whose special voice had blown into his spirit, the wind that mocked them with its freedom, entering and escaping the camp a thousand times a day, the wind that tortured them with the odors of the burning, the olfactory evidence that their only escape would be on that same wind that would snatch them up as their smoke wraiths fled from the pits. Then he heard voices, far away, low barks of orders that he wondered if he imagined rather than heard through the speakers. But no, they were there, followed by a harshly whispered imprecation that quieted them. And the music began. It nailed him to the chair as though a thick spike of ice had been driven through his heart and into the seat back. 
The volume was moderate, the tone was mellow, but the unison notes captured him between the octaves as though there were not nor had there ever been any other sound in the world. He would have screamed had he had the breath. The music...